Well, the economy and the business climate, that's a hot subject. But it is. It governs so much of what we do. But in, in the light of that, I got quite hot and bothered getting here. It took me about an hour and a quarter to travel, to travel about 10 k's. You know, I used to run Comrades and be a regular runner. And I used to run 10 k's in 50 minutes. And now it takes an hour and a quarter. So, just one of those things about being... Okay. Thank you. I hope everybody else has remembered to switch their phone off. Right. So we're going to look at the state of the business climate. How easy or how difficult, how challenging it is to do business, to do the business, whatever it is that you're that you're uh, involved in. Or perhaps if you're simply an investor for your own account and not in business, how easy or difficult it is to pick out winners or how difficult it is to pick out winners and how very easy at the moment it is to pick out losers. So what we're going to do then is... Um, which way? Okay. To start off with, to look at uh, the, uh, the... Where are the biggest factors in the economy? We're going to start with the US. I'll tell you why in a minute. But what's happening there? Post the 2009 recession, where everybody got knocked up, knocked back, they're recovering. They had quite a robust recovery initially, and that's very important because of the size of their economy. We'll see that at the moment. 19.5% of the world economy is made up by the, GD, by, by, by the US. How do we measure it? GDP, gross domestic product. We know that what that is, the sum of all goods and services produced in one year. So you can measure one country against another that way. Okay, next biggest trading block uh, is the EU that has established a base for recovery, but it's not going anywhere very quickly. That's important. They're our biggest trading partner, so we're not going to go anywhere very quickly either. Then we've got emerging markets. We're part of that, and their outperformance. Initially, when we had the recovery from 2009, liquidity was pumped into the financial markets, had to go somewhere. It went into all sorts of assets. It also went into promoting a lot of growth, particularly in China, industrial growth uh, in, in China and uh, in various industries. And what happened then was there was a big demand for what we do. What do we do best? We dig stuff out the ground and sell it as is. We don't improve it, we just sell it as is, and that we do very well and very efficiently, or we used to until Labour decided that they'd put a stop to that. Anyway, let's go on then and just say, okay, what's been happening is we've... Oh, I'm going to do it quickly. Here we are, okay. Um, that, that outperformance that we had initially because of the huge demand for our commodities, whether it was iron ore or coal or diamonds or platinum, has slowed. It hasn't dried up, but it has slowed. So we face the risk of what's called risk aversion because it's quite clear that our economy is not in a strong go-for-growth phase at the moment. It's actually in a growth phase, but in a very mild one. And so the uh, funds that came here that were allocated for our strong growth prospects they used to say that here we were a leading example of an emerging market, strong growth economy. And we don't have strong growth anymore. Okay, so funds are returning. All the funds that the, the flocked into the financial sector are going back elsewhere or to where they came from, where they think there'll be better short-term be benefits. So I'll just sum it up. It's a tough business, business environment, and it's likely to continue this year. Okay, now let's just look at the world economy. Just out of interest sake, the size. Okay, the U.S. 19.5%, the Eurozone 13.6%, China 14.7%. China, that one country, is bigger than the whole of that European Union together. That's significant because, uh, say, uh, 10 years ago, that percentage wasn't 14, that percentage was 5. So that's a huge change. Japan, 55 uh, interesting, 5 years ago, that was 7%. South Africa, 0.7%. Do you think anybody cares what happens here? <laughs> you know, sub-Saharan Africa, 2.5%. <coughs> okay, so that's important because this used to be that sub-Saharan Africa was about 2% and we were 1% of the total global activity. But the rest of the world has grown and we've just been standing still. 
or something like that. Now we see at what, why has this happened? Well, quite easy. The U.S. has a start. Uh, in 2012, drew at 2.8. Last year, at uh, 1.9. That's still a forecast number. And 2.8 is forecast for next year. So the biggest economy is growing at a much slower rate. So everybody grows at a slower rate. Because the U.S. is everybody's favorite export destination. The Eurozone, 2012, minus 0.7. Last year, minus 0.4. It's not going anywhere very quickly, is it? Except they've got the brakes on at the moment. And next year, they're looking at a growth of 1%. Our biggest export destination is hardly growing or going to reverse in some areas. China, that is where the only <coughs> sorry, strong growth area is. Okay, China, uh, 2012 grew at 7.7, .7, last year 7.7, .7, and next year they're estimating 7.5. Now this is, you say, well, that's pretty darn good. Wouldn't we like to be there? Of course we would. But remember that that's coming off a base where three years or so ago, it was growing at over 12%. So it's quite a lot less, but it's still, by global standards, it's still robust growth. I think that that is what counts, but they're trying to change the nature of the economy. We'll get to that. Japan, they're trying to stimulate it. They are flooding money into the market. You know, they even got to a stage where the Japanese uh, Treasury sent back uh, checks from taxpayers and said, you keep it. We've got enough. Spend it. Do you know what the Japanese did? What did the people do? They put it in the bank to save it. It never got out into the economy. So clearly that was a massive transfer from the public to the private sector with no benefit at all to anyone. Uh, there we are. So it doesn't look like they're going anywhere too fast. South Africa, here we are. Uh, 2012, we grew at 2.5%. Last year, a measly 1.8%. This was coming off a stronger growth phase too, so that wasn't too bright. And uh, next year, 2.8. These numbers, by the way, our source for this is the IMF. Uh, so, you know, we'll say it's a globally acceptable source. But remember, the IMF is often, if anything, slightly uh, more positive than they need to be. So, there we are. That's just slightly more optimistic than it turns out. Sub Saharan Africa, look what they're expecting. Uh, 4.8 last year, uh, 2012, 5.1 last year. What we think it will be growing 6.1. Where are we? We're losing our place in the African continent, uh, largely, be, uh, I think partly because of government policy, because we make it so darn difficult to start a business, to run a business, and to do it competitively for all sorts of reasons. We'll come to some of those. Okay, so to go on from there, what I'm trying to do now is just say, here's the environment. Why do you want to know? Because you want to say, what's the environment am I investing in? Are you going to pour all your savings into way out growth prospects? Both prospects overall aren't looking too bright. Okay, so we'll come along there. So what, what we saw here was the global economic outlook. Um, what we had is uh, after the 2009 recession, that was bad. That's why it's called the Great Recession. It's the rec worst recession we've had worldwide since, uh, since uh, the middle 30s. So that really is bad. Even I don't remember that long. So anyway, okay. So we saw there, and what happened was they... The, the central banks of the major countries in the world pumped liquidity in. They made funds available. This brought down interest rates. Why? Because there was more money than there were borrow available than there were borrowers. So the cost of it came down quite considerably. And what happened then was that a lot of people borrowed too much. So you got high public and private debt burdens. And of course, that meant high unemployment coming from that weak housing markets. What we're seeing now is they still keep they just say they're releasing the brakes, but it's still pretty tight monetary policy. So not really easily, not going to grow too strongly from there. What's happening in the U.S., very interesting. Just look at the growth phase there. On the fourth quarter of last year, it, it grew by 3.2% um, after 4.1% in the third quarter. So that looked pretty good. But that rate of growth is slowing. And if that as the industrial engine of the world is slowing, that is very important. Now, chairperson, the, chair, the Federal Reserve, the central bank of the U.S., uh, has a chairperson, uh, Yellen, and she said last night, the economy has not shown robust growth, unemployment remains above the long-term average, not much, but still above, and they're going to say they're going to continue easy monetary policy as quantitative easing, that's uh, the liquidity injections, is gradually tapered. What's everybody, tapering is the new word. What does that mean? They pumped money into the system. How much? up to uh, $85 billion 
dollars a month. How did they do that? They bought government bonds, other mortgage securities package in uh, in in the financial markets, put money in. They hoped it would go to the banks, and the banks would lend it out. But the bank banks are so scared about credit risk, it's not going very far, and that's a problem. Okay, so what what they're saying is they are nevertheless they feel there's enough money in the system, probably too much. They're pulling this back a bit, pulling it back at the rate of ten billion dollars a month. Not every month, but whenever they make a change, so it's come down from uh, 85, 85 to seventy-five. No, it's come come down from sixty-five to fifty-five at the moment. Okay, so what it is, it's still taking money out, and interest rates are probably not going to go down any longer. If anything, we are likely to see the next rate, the next move in interest rates worldwide and in South Africa will be higher, definitely not lower. Okay, the eurozone uh, still remains weak. GDP, just look at this. Once again, remember our major trading partner. In the 0.3 percent in the fourth quarter of last year, the previous quarter was 0.1. Well, it was better, but it's still hardly going, isn't it? You know, it really doesn't matter too much. So really no strong growth potential there. Some demand for our exports, but nothing that's ratcheting up too quickly. So certainly then, now we look at China. China's important because remember, it's nearly 15% of global uh, GDP. So it is big, big, the next second biggest economy now. And um, what we're seeing there, they, they, they really put their economy into boom mode. About a billion people... Uh, they, they urbanized 300 million of them to, to try and keep, get going the wheels of industry to make sure that if people, instead of going and planting a grain of rice every day or however often, uh, they rather walk to the shop and buy a loaf of bread, even if they had to work seven days a week, all day, every day. Could teach our labor something, couldn't they? But they just said a job is a privilege, not a right. I think it's a big difference in attitude there. That was that sort of attitude cause them to grow quite considerably. Okay, but so now what we see, demand for, for industrial and energy-based commodities, what they buy from us, coal, iron ore, and so on, and that is, uh, that, that is diminishing, it's slowing. The, the labor surplus that they had isn't as strong as it is, so they're not quite as, uh, not as big as it was, so it's not quite as competitive as it was, and what we're seeing there is that uh, the productivity growth, which they got through continually low, low uh, uh, infrastructure costs, Low labor costs is beginning to mount up. They can't be so competitive as they used to. So no problem. We'll just take another 300 million people, bring them into the industrial centers. They'll all be consumers and, uh, you know, demand for our goods will we'll ratchet up. It's a different sort of economy. Will it happen? The time will tell. Uh, but, you know, it's not at the rate I think perhaps they'd like to see Japan. Certainly they're responding to the stimulus, but people aren't with them. It's after all they'd rather save than spend, so that makes it quite difficult. So there's a good idea on the world economy. Okay. Oh. All right. So a little bit further on there, what we can look at then is a slow economic recovery prospects. Uh, from our point of view, we've not only got that, remember, to supply those base commodities, we find that because of that, we don't have a lot of investment flow into South Africa. In some cases, First, to some extent, so that's not good. And of course, the major credit uh, rating agencies of the world who say, you know, how did we rate you? They're having a look at this and say, hey, you've got a high current account deficit, you've got a high budget deficit, the amount you're borrowing is going up. You know, we're going to make it more difficult for you to borrow because you're not as good as good a risk as you were. And then people don't bring the money in to buy our government bonds and other securities. What we're looking at here, government debt to GDP ratio, they're looking in the last budget, stabilizing around 45% in 2016-17. In Trevor Manuel's time, when he was a, a finance minister, by the way, I think the best finance minister we've ever had, um, he had brought down uh, that ratio to around 30%. You say, well, it's only gone up. It's only going up another 15%. It's going up 50% more than it was as a ratio. That's important. Um, and uh, remember, in his days, we also had a, a balanced budget. We, our income and expenditure, government's income and expenditure, were equal. That's not happening at the moment. Meanwhile, in the U.S., just look at their debt to GDP ratio. It's over 100 percent. Never mind that. In Japan, it's 200 percent. So, are we at risk with those? Remember, in Japan, the, the interest rates are zero point nothing to zero point one. You know, it's, it really is so low. It, so it's available. 
and there's plenty of funding there from their own resources. Japan's rates, uh, their base rate is between 0 and 0 0.25. So, you know, really the cost of funding is very, very low indeed. That's where the difference is. Okay. Let's go on there and let's just say, now we're going to look at a few graphs. Why should we? Because I always think that uh, um, a picture tells a thousand words. And if it's so a few pictures, you won't have to listen to many, so many of my words. So that may be a relief. Anyway, let's see here. We have a look. This is the dollar. Oh, shucks. I haven't quite got the hang of that. Okay, the dollar index. What's the dollar index? It's a trade weighted rand. A uh, trade weighted dollar. Not quite the same thing. It's the dollar measured against a basket of currencies of its major trading partners, those people with whom they do business on a country to country basis. And it's measured according to the volume of business that they do with each of those countries, hence trade weighted dollar. And that tells you the true value, where it's going and what, where, what it's been doing. So we can see here, it's quite, damn it, man. It's quite, uh, sorry, I won't say dollar. Okay. Uh, what, we, what, what you can see is it's been quite volatile over, uh, over this period from 2009, the year before the recession, here between the, uh, the level of 72 and 88. Say, so, well, that is quite volatile. Wait till you see the rand. Then you can see volatility. Okay. So what you see now is, interestingly, that the dollar has been weakening, but it's within this triangular pattern, and uh, I would say that it's probably going to remain around about that level. Why should that be? Because they are going to be putting interest rates up probably by the end of the year. That makes the, the dollar investments, the dollar investment arena more attractive because you can earn more on your money and probably find funds growing back there. Okay, so what we're looking at is a dollar remaining steady to possibly stronger this year. How are we going to measure the RAND? What do we think is going to happen? The RAND measured against a globally stronger dollar is going to find it very difficult to gain any momentum at all. All right, so let's go on there. Got it right that time. Let's look at the euro. It's the second biggest currency, traded currency in the world, and uh, so that makes it quite important. And of course, they're a great trading block. What we see here is how since no, you know, I really want to do that. Okay, I'm getting wrong. Okay, so we, we have to look here at the at the trend that we saw from 2008. The euro weakened quite considerably. Okay, it had bottom here in 2010, another bottom in 2012. If you're interested in technical analysis, this is quite encouraging. The second bottom wasn't as weak as the first one, so at least it wasn't coming those same depths again. That's encouraging. However, the trend was weakening quite considerably until 2012, middle of 2012, and it did start to pick up a bit. And you see then a series of rising lows, rising highs. That's encouraging. It says momentum is building up. It's looking more optimistic. But look over here, what's happened. This trend, downtrend, has been broken. Will it stay? We don't know. But what we have to do is say, that's like somebody with a little red flag saying, look at me, something's changed. Go and check it out or keep a watch because it may be important. And I think it is important. If that is maintained, it just says that there are expectations that Euroland is actually starting to look better. They're also going to have higher interest rates one of these days, be a better place to invest, and maybe the Euro will be a stronger currency. Okay, so let's go there. Let's look at the RAND now. First of all, we look at the RAND against the dollar. Why? Because it's a global it's a measure of everything. It's a measure of everything that we produce and export, and it's a global measure of one currency against another. What we can see here is uh, since 2009, a weakest level of just over 11 RAND, just worse than 11 RAND. That was terrible. Uh, it may have been overdone. You could say it certainly was, because if you see what happened subsequently, it strengthened quite considerably. As China and other of the, uh, the Far Eastern uh, industrial tigers got going, look for our coal, look for our iron ore, look for our platinum. Uh, and that's then what you saw then was the RAND strengthened because they were buying lots of our stuff and uh, therefore we had a, a positive uh, flow in cash flow in that sort of case. However, from 2011, there were doubts about the sustainability of this. Look what happened to the RAND. Okay, the RAND is now about uh, 1080, 1090. It's called nearly 11 RAND to the dollar. In 2011, it was only three years ago, it was 6 RAND 50. That's 80% weaker. That's terrible. That's how much more you're going to have to pay for anything that you, you know, compared to what you paid then. That's terrible. That just shows 
what, what, what has changed? And it's not, it's not quite 80, but it's a very high percentage. But it does say that what's happened, look at this trend, strong, weakening trend. That's not good. I drew some horizontal lines in here, and you'll see how it seems to go in trading bands. Had this big bottom sort of W shape there. Then we had this next range here from about uh, 860 or so up to just over 9 Rand. And it just broke through. When you get a break above the previous ceiling, they say what happens quite often is the previous ceiling then becomes a floor for a new higher trading range, in this case, weaker trading range. So it's important to watch out for those things. Don't say you are a technical analyst or you are a fundamental, a fundamental analyst or you are this or that. Try and look at all the factors, all the ways of examining it. So you see here, then uh, uh, last year we had quite a good range there. Between about uh, nine rand, uh, where was it? About nine rand eighty. Sorry, I'm trying to find the way away. There is about nine rand fifty, and up to eleven rand shortly. What I think now is it, it was sold up, sold too far, too fast. Maybe it was overdone. All sorts of reasons. I mean, there's political jitters, uh, pre-election uh, nervousness. There's the labour situation. Why does it matter? Well, you know, uh, the uh, platinum was last year was our most valuable export. We're not exporting it. Well, we, we are exporting what they had, the inventory they had, but it looks like they're going to run out of that, what all the inventory that they had stored. Now there's not going to be any more, and what's going to happen? Well, certainly think of what our exports are going to do. Think of what our balance of payments is going to be like. Very unhappy looking. Okay, where do I think the RAND is going to be? Gee, stick my neck out. I think that in the short term, we'll probably see a little bit of a range here between about uh, 1050 and 11 RAND, but you know, a break through one of those lines has to be watched carefully. The trend is clear. Long-term, weaker. There's no doubt about that. Okay. So let's look at what all this means. People, you, you get people, even in Parliament, I shouldn't say even in Parliament, they really prove their, their lack of knowledge about this. We won't call it ignorance. We'll just call it lack of knowledge. But it's the same thing. So we say, so we say okay, we've got to have a weak rand. Why? Because our exports will earn more rands. But what will it do? Our cost inputs will rocket up. We'll show some of those in a moment. So what we see here, what we want, we we want a, a, not a not a strong rand, but a steady rand. That way business can plan, and that's what's important. If you see a lot of volatility, you say, well, do you want to go and buy stocks, whatever, when they never know what the cost inputs are going to be? It makes the whole investment seem very, very difficult indeed. So we have a look here. These are important facts. Appreci rand appreciation, strengthening, it reduces the costs of imported equipment. If you want to buy new plant machinery, uh, it costs you fewer rands, and that's very important. And if you have that, that means that uh, your unit production costs, the cost per, per gadget, whatever it is you're making, is lower. That means you can improve your global price competitiveness. That means you're going to export more, you're going to earn more, you're going to earn more profits. Higher output volumes raises profitability, and it proves, improves the attraction for foreigners to come and invest in your economy. And that's really important um, because we need their capital. And then what happens is you get that job creation, you get the people who've got new jobs, spending, the whole thing is a wonderful virtuous circle. It's what we don't have. That's a tragedy. It really is what we don't have, but it's what we need. So people say, you know, uh, can't cope with a strong rand. You can cope with a steady rand. Preferably stronger than it is now. Rand depreciation, rand weakening. Uh, it increases the cost of imports. Just look at what's happening to petrol. It's not a higher oil price. The oil price has been coming down, but the petrol price has been going up. Why? Because we pay for oil in rands, and those rands then get converted into dollars. We need more rands to pay for each barrel of oil that's at a, that's at a dollar day basis. Okay, so rand depreciation increases the cost of import of capital equipment. You want to grow your business, you, you, you need new machinery, new plant. Well, we don't make the equipment, we don't make the, the machinery here. We've got to import that to get our factories going, and it costs more if you've got a weaker rand. Okay, so rand raises unit production costs in rand terms. It reduces how competitive you can be when you export your goods globally. Uh, it lowers then the output because fewer people want, want your volumes and it reduces profitability. That means that foreigners take their capital and go. They say, oh, no, thank you. We're not going to make any progress here. And what happens? Then you get job destruction instead of job creation. And that completes the vicious investment circle. So when you hear these so-called authorities saying, we must have a weak rand, we must not. And if they don't believe, 
Just look at that. It's very important. So when you see the, the rand weakening, yes, you can temporarily go and buy rand hedge stocks. But remember, when they've got to buy, get new plant and equipment, it's going to cost them more. It'll make cost them more to produce their goods. It won't last for too long. Okay, there we go. So all these things are very important to say, are we going to be buyers or sellers? And if so, what are we going to be buying and selling? Now, this is the, the rand effect of uh, nominal, nominal effect of exchange rate. What's that? Remember we looked at the dollar index? This is the rand equivalent, uh, except it's not going the same way, is it? This is to say what is the trade weighted rand, the rand invest, uh, measured against a basket of currencies of our major trading partners, against the euro, the dollar, the yen, uh, the, the, the Chinese yuan, and so on. Now, what I'd like to show you is 1995. Okay, it's not mine. <laughs> but look at this number. 1995, okay? The, the dawn of democracy. This is an index, and it was at over 160. Okay? Remember that. Now, this is against the whole basket of the currencies of the world. Where are we? Down here, 50. So, how many more of today's rands do you need to buy the same good that you bought in 1995? It's terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. The value of the rand has gone from 160 on that index down to 50. Clearly, you need three and a half times more rands to buy whatever you bought then. And they say we need a weaker rand. We don't. This has destroyed a large part of South Africa's economy, and it's very important to look at that. Uh, because clearly wages and incomes and certain certainly haven't all kept up with that. Okay, that's just to give a bit of background. Now let's have a look to show you what it means in practical terms. The rand against the yen. Okay, now just quite startling. Here you are, 2008, 2009, in fact, end of 2009. One rand bought 17 and a half yen. Okay, why did we have to buy yen? We've got to buy. Toyota Motors to fit into the bodies that we manufacture here. Okay, so we've got to get all that capital equipment. So every rand, we could get 17 yen. One year later, only one year, one rand would buy eight and a half yen. It was 17 and now it's eight and a half. It had halved in value. We need twice as many rands to buy the same stuff that we're selling in yen. That just shows, you know, I think it's important. You know, the, the, the government of the Reserve Bank, I was at a... At, at, at a gathering that they had, and I had the governor to myself for about three minutes, which is a rare treat. And we were talking about the threats to the RAND. And she said, never forget, the greatest threat to inflation is the RAND exchange rate. Clearly, because look, the RAND weakens, and everything that we import costs more, and we import a heck of a lot of our stuff that we don't make, and that is it. So that really, it just backs the story. But look what happens when you have some stability, wherever it is. When you've got it going sideways like it was here, between 11 and 13 yen to the rand, you could plan your business. You knew what was coming. You knew where you, how to set your, your cost basis, how to set your prices. But watch this if you're interested in technical analysis. <coughs> you had that range and said, oh, an emergence from a triangle. Very often it can be explosive. And the move to the base of the triangle, the move out of that is very often the same thing again. And you can see that bit there, very similar to that bit there. That's very rough and ready. There's something to look at. How big should the move be? Now look at this going sideways here. 9, 10, 2000, into most of 2011, we had that range. Watch these ranges. When it breaks up, see what happens next. Broke down, struggled back, didn't get back up there, and what happened then? It gave us a, that's it, we belong weaker down, lower down, and that's what happened. So look for things like that. You know, if you're watching a stock price, just see. You can see it goes sideways for a while. You say, ah, oh, stabilizing, stabilizing. See which way it breaks out. See if it can sustain that move. You know, here, tried to, came back, let go again. That just shows we're now heading for a weaker trading range, the yen against the rand. I think that shows it. And just look at the trend here. You've got declining highs, declining lows. Trend is losing momentum, it's losing, it's losing those gains that it had earlier. Okay, let's go on from there. And you can apply this, this, this sort of theory to, to whether it's shares or bonds or, or, or currencies or whatever. Gives you an indication. Do, just because you get a technical signal, don't say, oh, look, it's got a sell signal. I must go out and sell. No, it's a signal. Go and investigate it. Watch the change in the fundamentals. And I think that is of primary importance. All right, so let's go on from there then. Okay, we're talking about uh, how the, the currency 
uh, it promotes inflation, and let's just see what it does. First of all, inflation comes first of all into the cost of production. Producer, uh, they call that uh, PPI, producer price index, producer input costs. They go up, cost of manufacturing goes up, cost of output, cost of the finished goods goes up, and the cost of what we have to pay goes up too. Pity incomes didn't keep count in such a way. But there we are. So we've got a, a target a target band. The government, the uh, Reserve Bank, no, the government says, sets a target band, which is 3 to 6%. Okay? That bottom line is 3, horizontal, that's 6%. That's where inflation should be. Well, it doesn't pay much attention to that, does it? Now, if we have a look here, PPI, producer inflation, that's the red line. The other line, is the green line, uh, so the blue line, I beg your pardon, is consumer inflation. How much more we have to pay for the same goods after a length of time. Producer inflation is a clear leader. It, it moves further, faster than consumer inflation. So don't say consumer inflation is up. Look for producer inflation. It's going to tell you two or three months beforehand what's likely to be happening. That's very important. Better to have advance notice than to say, oh, I didn't see it coming. There's always an advance indicator somewhere. But while I think of it, by the way, anybody has a, uh, somebody looked like they're about to put up a hand. I think maybe it was whatever. If you have a question as I go along, just put, put your hand up, and if I don't notice, just wave. <laughs> and we'll see if we can answer the questions as we go along. All right. Okay, so what you see then is producer inflation, far more volatile than consumer inflation, and it's starting to go up quite a lot above that target, target band. And consumer inflation, though, uh, is following it. I'd say we're going to see higher inflation. The one leads to the other. And normally, conventionally, you'd say if it goes right out of that target band, you expect the Reserve Bank to take action. The only tool they have, interest rates. They can, they can uh, target the repo rate, the best lending rate, and change that. And, of course, then the banks should follow suit. So clearly, there's no room for lower interest rates. And that's important to know. The cost of doing business is going to be higher. Must be. You know, the cost of capital is higher. All right, let's go on from there. Okay, I mentioned oil just now. Just look at what happens here. We've had, uh, since uh, 2008, 2000, the end of 2007, the oil price has fluctuated hugely. When we had the recession, demand for power, demand for energy plummeted. And we had it coming down here from 145 all the way down to $37 a barrel. Okay, well. Heck, could it have been that long? It wasn't that long ago. You know, it was only f uh, five years, and it was down there. And look how it built up again. Once that uh, uh, flood of capital, of liquidity, got back into from the central banks of the world into the economies of the world, then we saw that the, the wheels of industry got going, the demand for energy got going, and so the oil price went up. And look what happened. It came all the way up here. But look where we've been since then, 2011 to now in a band about $90 to a top level of about $125, and it just looks as though it's staying that way. But interesting, if you go over the last two and a half years or so, do you know what you see there? Each top was below the previous top. You say, well, that's strange. Don't see it in our petrol price, do you? And we've got a very good graphic of that in a moment. So you say, what's going on? Uh, because there is now still the same amount of oil being needed, but there's more, there's more being produced. You know, the... Uh, uh, the uh, the U.S. used to be the biggest importer of oil in the world. In about two or three years' time, maybe sooner, they will be entirely self-sufficient. They've just got new sources. They've got more coming from Alaska. They've got more coming from the, uh, the, the what's the process called? Shale oil. They've got gas off the western, western coast. They've got new ultra-deep uh, uh, oil wells in the Gulf of Mexico. There's more. There's going to be more than they need. They are looking to becoming a net exporter within a couple of years, having been the biggest importer. So what's going to happen to the oil price? Certainly it's not going to go any higher. Yeah, and the chances are it could go lower. And uh, uh, China, the next biggest uh, oil consumer, is still taking a lot. But they can't take that much more than the U.S. is cutting back. And, of course, they're also looking for their own oil replacement industries. So I think what this is, why does this matter to us? The cost of energy is a major inflation driver, the, the major one. And I think that if we look at that, we say, well, maybe we're not going to see the huge 
changes in inflation worldwide that we were getting in the past. Inflation in the U.S. is under 1%. Um, in some countries, it's actually gone negative because so few people are spending uh, that everybody's marking their prices down. And so inflation becomes you know, a, a negative number. I don't think we're going to get that here. But the, the thing is that we're not going to get the sort of swings that we had in the past. Now, I just want to go on from here. Did I get that right? Oil sideways, okay? That's oil there. This is on an index basis. We said, let's put it at 100. Assume it was 100 in 2011. Where is it now? At 110. So it's 10% higher than it was then. Not a big change. Oil paid for in RAND terms is up here at 160. It is 60% more expensive than it was in 2011. But in international markets, it's only 10%. What's happening? Are we being cheated? What, what is going on? No, it's just the RAND cost. The RAND exchange rate has uh, has got weakened to such an extent we need so many more rands that that's pushed up our cost of oil and look what's happened to petrol. Petrol shouldn't be up here, not if the rand had stayed where it was, but it didn't and that's a fact of life. So it just goes to show, in fact, the greatest threat to South African inflation is the rand exchange rate and that just shows how that pushed that index there from 100 up to uh, 160. I think one has to rest the case of the threat the rand is to the to inflation. It's not just to us as consumers, it's to business, it's to everyone. You know, everybody there's a transport index in, in a transport component. In everything, there's a cost of doing business. It makes us a lot less competitive. Okay. Now let's look at uh, sorry, let's look at equity markets. I'm sure a lot of you have come here just to say, what have we got to say about equity markets? Well, quite a bit actually. Let's look at the S&P 500. That's an index of the top 500 companies quoted on the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, they give a really a good broad base of what's going on in the U.S. economy. And so you can say if the S&P goes up, that's probably in anticipation of companies of the economy going faster, of companies making more profits, paying out more dividends, and hence share prices rising. And look at what's happened since it happened since the recession. I mean, it came plummeting. Oh, it came plummeting down, as you can see here, from uh, uh, 1600. In the end of 2007, all the way down here to under 700, does just just does just go to show. If you're brave and you buy when they say the blood is running in the streets, you can do quite well. Of course, it takes a very brave person. It's not always very easy. In fact, it's very difficult. But look for little things like this. See that W shape? Go across the middle. It came out. Came went, went above there. Came back. It started growing. That's very often a sign of a major change from downward base to upward base, well, slightly, slightly upward, just something to look, to, to look out for. And what we can see here has the, the pace of change has increased, and it may possibly be getting too, too hectic there, but it does say if you draw a line across those tops, go to the top of that upper parallel again. So it just says, just be, be wary. I'm not going to say it's going to come tumbling down, but it's going, it's going to be a lot more difficult to make new highs. Why does this matter? You know, it's interesting that there's a quite a good correlation from a directional point of view, up and down only, between the New York Stock Exchange and the JSE, and the JSE's major indices. And uh, you watch these and you say, if it happens there, first, it's likely to happen here sometime after. So it is a good direction indicator, and I just get the idea that at the moment this... That idea is a mistake, wrong, isn't it? Uh, that, that, that at the moment the momentum, upward momentum, isn't as strong as it was. Okay, let's go on from there then. Let's say, okay, let's look at the JSE. Similar decline, 2009 turnaround, and we got above that big base there, that big base level, uh, and once it went up, see how it went through? Came back, got to that longer-term uh, rising line, and then took off again. However, once again, uh, I think, you say, well, how much further can it go? Okay. Let's look at that. Nobody knows for sure. But let's look and say, is the JSE fair value? Is it good value or is it not value? How do we measure it? PE, price earnings ratio, the, the ratio of the share price to the earnings per share. And what do we see here? The, the uh, red line is the all share index. Okay, up there at its peak, here you see it across here, it's around about 47,000. Take that across there. 
And then we see this other line, that is the price earnings ratio, the PE, on the Aussie, on the all share index. So when it's up here, it means there are big expectations and the profits had better come out quickly, otherwise share prices aren't going to stay there. We are now, we have been recently at the highest level we've ever been. The long term average, 14.6. Where, where are we at the moment? At 16.9. It's, it's expensive. It's inexpensive territory. Um, it's, you know, well over the long term. Here, that middle line there, dark blue line, that's the average. Well, I would suggest that if we don't get a real improvement in the economy, and remember the figures we are looking at, that's not looking at strong growth, then it may take a while. Not that the market has to come tumbling down. It will take a long time, or some time, for the, the, the earnings momentum to catch up with the share price momentum that we've been seeing. That, that's a, you know, a, a conservative way of looking at it. One would not be surprised to see it come back, to see that ratio come back to the longer term, middle mean there of 14.6. But remember, quite often what happens is instead of coming down and sticking around that median line, uh, it goes swings one way and then the other way. So those people who are prophets of doom and gloom and say, oh, it's going to halve, it's going to do this, go that, it's not impossible. I think it's unlikely. We're not facing a calamity, but I think that's unlikely. But nevertheless, one can make a point of, point of it without it being derisory. So I think, you know, look at the overall market. Where's the long-term PE? 14.6. Where is it now? Heck, it was up over 19, highest it's ever been. That had to be too expensive considering the state of the market, unless something extraordinary happened. And uh, I think there have been some big changes and not positive ones. So that just says you know, expensive territory. Now, let's look at those big changes. This just shows foreign flows into or out of, foreign portfolio flows, as I say, foreign investors bringing in their dollars, their, their uh, euros, whatever, and putting them in South Africa to buy uh, either our, to buy either our, uh, our bonds, RSA bonds, that's in the, that, the blue line, or our equities, which is the red line. Now, what does it mean if they're buying equities? It means that they think they're going to get better returns from here, the JSE, from the South African economy, from South African companies going to make better profits, pay better dividends, have better performance than they can get at home. Now, look at their, what's happened to their view on the South African corporate outlook and the South African uh, economy. Take the red lines. Okay, 2008. There was a massive outflow from all high-risk areas, and we're a high-risk area, so leave that. But look what happened from the recovery, 2009. That's what they pumped in, uh, over $70 billion to buy stocks on the JSE. The next year, 2010, it was over here, and it was about $35 billion. The next year, 2011, they took money out. They took it, sold stocks, net sellers. Ah, and what do you think that did to prices? That certainly put a cap on them. 2012. They're still taking it out. 20, 2013, it was a zero number. It's close to zero. So that doesn't show a big confidence build up by foreigners in South Africa. Bear that in mind if you get, you know, for your outlook for the economy as a whole. It really is important because that's where the big money flows come from. And then here we are seeing a net inflow at the moment. Uh, but compared to the size of what we had, we're nearly a quarter of the way through the year, we're not going to get anywhere near what we had before, and it may just be temporary, whatever. It just says that foreigners do not share an enthusiastic view of our market. Now let's look at bonds. The, the, the confidence or otherwise in getting a good rate of return from what has always been a reliable borrower, the government of South Africa, and whether or not they're going to have to put it. If they put up interest rates, what happens? The value of the bonds comes down. So clearly they have some views on that, don't they? Because look at where they are here. Net sellers this year. First time since 2008. Look what happened in 2012. There was a massive inflow, over 90 billion in a year. There was a much smaller level in, in uh, 2013 and now net outflow. Now just how quickly can it change? This is important because this says how quickly can the stability of the market change? Look at it on a monthly basis. We had, yeah, you're right, say, shoo. it's a big shoe. Just three years, two and a half years. We look at 2012, 2013, 2014. 2012, mostly in bonds, they were buyers, one month of small sellers. 2013, more buyers than sellers. 
No, only initially. Uh, from January to October, there was a net uh, 60 billion inflow, total 60 billion. In November, they took over 20 billion out. One month. In January, December was pretty much equal. In January, they took, it was nearly 30 billion out. So most of what they brought in, in the, for, the, for, the, for the previous 12 months was taken out. That's a, that's a huge turnaround. That's a very fast depletion of the availability of cash in South Africa. And I think that that says, you know, yes, we've had a little bit of a recovery here, but it's much slower than it was in the past. Why does it matter? Because remember, our shares can be bought on the, on, on the London Stock Exchange, can be bought in some other international markets, and the prices are always offset against each other. So if they get a fright, they'll first sell them on their own market, then they'll sell them on our market. And what's the RAND going to do? We're going to be more sellers and buyers of RAND, and so we'll see RAND depreciation. Yes, sir. There's going to be less liquidity in markets. It's likely to mean that there could be some more of these funds going out rather than in. So it's just another beware signal. It would be very difficult. If worldwide risk appetite is going, going to be taken down, interest rates will probably go up. Not by much, but the cycle, which has been lowering and going along a base, is likely to go up. Look for better opportunities. Go and buy a dollar, the dollars where you can get positive returns from government treasuries. At least you know, you know, at, at the moment, at, you get times. It's not just return on capital, it's return of capital. We, we may not be so good at that. Okay. Okay. Let's look at what's happening to our government bond market. Very important. That's the cost of government borrowing to balance budgets or to offset the deficits. You can see that we had here in 2008, uh, and we had a, a rate as high as 10.5%, came down there to 7%, been mostly going sort of sideways between 8 and 9% uh, since then. But in the last year or so, it's come down to what were clearly unsustainable lows, just couldn't be held on. And here, if you just look, the cost of government debt, what is that? That's what the government has to pay for funds they borrow to offset the current account deficit, the budget deficit, and uh, it was there, it was costing them 6.5%, uh, where is it now? It's been up to 9%, down over here to about 8.5%. Look at the trend. Okay, sideways for quite a while, but it was basically declining overall. Then you had a breakup, two goes at it, and that second time, that move was sustained. Once again, you've got the pattern of rising lows down there from the middle of 2013, rising highs. That just says, instead of coming down like this, it's now going up like that. What's going to happen to the cost of servicing that debt? You're going to be asked to pay in. You know, surely that's what's going to happen, and that means that government are going to have a funding problem if it doesn't change. I think it means that we'll be paying more, for a government will be paying more for their debt, and that means there's less to go around on social grants and infrastructure spending. That's not a happy situation. Okay, this is just what a, uh, this is to say what are financial markets uh, forecasting on what interest rates are likely to do. Suffice to say, I think, that uh, what they're saying is big jump up there at the end. You see all those indicators, the early warning indicators are higher. But it's not always reliable, I just say as a trend, higher rates coming according to financial markets. Okay, so what do we have a look at? Where's a comparison? Let's look at what's happening to the gold price. We like to call the gold price, as you see there, we call it our fear index. Why? Because it's looked at as the last resort instead of paper money. Never mind, we'll put the money in gold, we'll buy some Kruger Rams, whatever. We'll always get our money back. That's true, but will you get as much back? That's debatable. But nevertheless, so we say, okay, why is gold bought? Store of value, uh, a hedge against inflation and a hedge against currency uh, volatility. It has been proved that over time. Since 2008, it's come up here, red. don't suppose we all remember, 750 been all the way up here to $1,900, and then just look, it broke that strong rising trend and went into a consolidating trend sideways. What's it doing now? It's sort of having a range here, it looks like between about 1200 and 1400 It's interesting enough, just made an initial break 
of that downtrend there. We've got to see if that's sustained. But I think we may see it. Best case outlook, maybe a run up to 1400. But, you know, there aren't good reasons to justify that at the moment. Needs a crisis to set it off. But at least it does seem to be stabilizing. What we say at least, what it may say is there could be further shocks coming to the financial system. So that says it's a time to be cautious rather than over adventurous. Let's go on from there. Here's something we got from the uh, Reserve Bank uh, Bulletin. I must say thank you to my colleague, Michelle, who is very good at taking these charts out. What is this? This here, okay, a graph. It's Reserve Bank's GDP, GDP graph. Where has GDP been over those dates there? And you can see the index over there, whether it's been positive above the line or negative below the line. Where it's got all this fan here, the line in the middle, is what the Reserve Bank reckons is the line of greatest probability, where they think it's most likely. Now, the last time they did this was November, and I'm afraid it's underperforming already and could be a bit more. What they were looking at then is from uh, 14th there. From here, they were looking at it staying uh, at initially at around about just below 4% and staying close to that. Well, at the moment, we know that last year GDP grew 1.8%. This is on a, uh, things on a quarter and quarter basis, annualized, isn't it? Yes, thank you. So, so it, it, it's, it's not just what we see at the end of the year. But remember, the end of the year, we saw 1.8%. This year, they're looking at 2.7%. Only in November, that's according to the budget, they were looking close to 4%. So just say, you know, that we really are looking at consumer demand is subdued. Uh, we're looking at limited credit demand. The banks are much tighter with their offering of credit. There's high unemployment. More and more, everybody knows somebody that's lost a job and is struggling to find another really is critical. Electricity and petrol prices have rocketed up, means there's less for spending and other goods. High household indebtedness, so this is interesting. When this whole cycle started in 2002, after 9-11, once again, big liquidity injections, that debt to, G to income ratio, personal debt to income ratio, was 52%. In 2008, it was 83%. Yes, it's come down. It's now 74%, but it's a heck of a lot higher than the starting point, we probably won't go back there. But it does say consumers don't have a heck of a lot else to push in to on the purchasing side to spend to get the economy going. All right, let's go on from there. That's what the Reserve Bank says about GDP. Let's look at what they say about inflation. It's the same sort of principle. You can see here, that's what happened to inflation. Look what happened to inflation at the time of the beginning of the recession, 2009, was up there at 13%. That's horrifying. It's what can happen. Of course, it came down quite quickly. And let's look now, let's look ahead to where they see it. Okay, initially in 2013, mostly just under uh, 6%. 6% is important. Remember, we looked at that, the guideline range, 3% to 6%. But they were seeing it drifting down by the end of 2015 to around about uh, uh, 5, 5 and a quarter percent. Now, however, as things have changed so quickly, it may impact because the weakness of Iran struggle to get to that sort of level, but that's what they were saying inflation is likely to, to be. So you can be sure that under those circumstances, there's little or no opportunity to cut rates, cut interest rates in the foreseeable future. There's more, remember, if it goes above that 6% line, that's the level where they expect to, to, to take action. The only action they can take uh, is, in fact, to, to alter interest rates. So I think it's important to look at that. What we can see here is, okay, we looked at the averages there. Uh, what we're seeing here, the risk to the upside, why it might it go, have cost push pressures, higher oil price, higher electricity uh, tariffs, higher wage settlements, exchange rate making everything we import more expensive. Um, and that does say, of course, there's some offset on the, on the downside, and there's less demand. So it's still more difficult to push up prices, and in fact, prices in some cases may have to be marked down. So that puts a bit of a break on that. But certainly, our view is interest rates likely to be raised Probably the first rate may only be 50 basis points, but uh, in the second half of second half of of, uh, of this year, and after that maybe again something similar next year. All right, so that's the interest rate outlook. Why does it matter? Because that's the cost of capital. If you see here inflation and uh, the everybody know what the repo rate. Let's just go into it. The repo rate, that is short for repurchase rate. That is the rate at which the government, at which the Reserve Bank will lend money to the major banks against the security of government bonds. They're not going to just hand it out. It must be against the security of government bonds on an overnight basis because we negotiate it every single day. So that is the best 
lending rate that's available, and that's the basis. Prime is usually set at about 3% above the, uh, the repo rate, so that's the base for our interest rates in South Africa. So if you look at the, the, the target band, uh, inflation target band, blue line is CPI, and of course when that goes up, you're more likely to get normally get interest rates rising. You see what happened here. They do turn parallel <coughs> parallel lines here. Um, what we're seeing here is the repo rate was 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 uh, was raised um, in anticipation of in, of inflation gathering momentum, which it did in fact. Okay, so they can they can move it in anticipation of changes as well as on changes. Okay. You're welcome. You can, Simon will let you know where to find the rest of it. Okay, so let's have a look. In summary, the economy and the business climate. <coughs> okay, world, in, world environment, we've looked at. Weak. Hard for us to do a heck of a lot else other than that. Increased uncertainty. I need to definitely need slimmer fingers, don't I? Um, increased uncertainty on changing monetary uh, monetary policies, world, major world banks. Um, okay. Inflation risks remain high because of the input costs, the cost of oil, the cost of everything we input. Interest rates have given good reasons why they could well be higher. Um, Currency volatility is going to make planning very difficult. While planning is so difficult, you find that businesses are reluctant to expand. Difficult to see them growing profitability considerably under those circumstances. It will be a break in, a break in effect. So it's here, as far as South African uh, investment is concerned, foreign direct investment, foreigners building factories and bringing machinery in, that's close to zero, I'm sorry to say. The portfolio flows very low at the moment. Because of weak growth prospects, Political uncertainty, uh, despite assurances on nationalization and leadership. Just look at this latest uh, legislation that's coming on the mining sector and the agricultural sector. If you want to start a new, whatever it is, certain sectors, and start the new venture, government takes 20%. That's it. Otherwise, you don't get a license start to start the, the operation. They then have the right to take up to 50% or more at a price they will determine. It's no longer market-related prices, and you can either take it or you can walk away. This is actually a very serious uh, impediment to getting foreign investors in South Africa. All right, let's go on from there. Uh, President Zuma's infrastructure development plan. He keeps on saying, state of the nation interest. Just look at all the infrastructure. Look at my infrastructure development plan. It's supposed to be 900 billion rands. Well, where is it? If you look at the major construction companies, they say, oh, we're not getting it. Who's getting it? Maybe it's been split up into very smaller parts, but that doesn't sound like efficiency. And all the small constructors, the bucky builders and so on, are getting business, but that's not the way to grow the economy. So, I, And I'm not sure about whether we're seeing that or very little of it. Electricity supplies, first of all, major problem on, on uh, delivery. Eskom should be able to produce about 43,000 megawatts. At the moment, when we had the, the power cuts, they were, they were down to below 35,000, 34,000, I think. So what it says is, where's all the rest? It's down for maintenance. It doesn't say too much about the reliability. We're not going to be able, the word is that they're going to stay at a very low level of uh, actual delivery compared to what the potential should be. They, they hope to make an announce soon, we've been told, announcement soon, we've been told, that they're simply going to, they may be to do with nuclear energy. We're unsure of that, but we'll see. Uh, I think that to build another power station, here, for the sort of growth that we are anticipating, what sort of growth? If we were to grow at 5% per annum, we would another, need another Mudipi or Prasili every five years for the next 20 years. Can we do it? No. So, you know, that's going to put a break on development. It also means that we could just get the Chinese, the Russians, or someone else, or the French, to do it all for us and bring it here. There's also a possibility of that. So, but in the meantime, you're not going to get a lot of development while well, we've got uncertainty of, of ESCOM supply. Labor employment. Jeez. Labor, uh, the labor policies at the moment uh, favor job destruction rather than job creation because you can't fire somebody 
your business slows, you can't lay them off temporarily even because that, that's against the rules. What is happening is you're finding a lot of those people who don't work uh, get social grants. There are now more people get, getting social grants from the government, government than they are working. Yeah, that's terrifying, isn't it? They don't, the social grants aren't very, aren't very much, but it's still there. And what that says is that we're becoming a socialistic society and we can't afford it. Doesn't sound like a good go for growth uh, situation. Simon, this should have been more cheerful, but <laughs> <laughs> never mind. Okay, it's how we see it. However, there are opportunities. There's some great opportunities. It's not all doom and gloom at all. Sub-Saharan Africa. Look at the oil that's being discovered. Look at all the mineral wealth that's suddenly being discovered. Look at Nigeria. Do you know Nigeria, they're busy recalculating their GDP data. They are expected to show that their economy is in fact the same or greater size than, than South Africa's, if not now, within the next two years. What, are, what opportunities are there? Is it surprising that people like ShopRite Checkers are building a new store there every week? Obviously they are, because that's where the future is. There are better margins, there's better, bigger risks, but nevertheless. So we are, in fact, the gateway to Africa. Why does Africa matter? Because it's undeveloped. It's that, as they say, the last frontier of undeveloped resources. They're finding a lot more oil, a lot more gas, energy that can... That, that can uh, uh, that can sustain their new industries. Really, South Africa has the infrastructure. We know how to deal with these, with the people. We know how to deal. We've got the experience in financing, in technology, practical applications, dealing with labor. We may not be doing too, too well at the moment, but we've dealt, dealt with any problems they're likely to get. We must surely be taken in as partners in first, third world uh, uh, partnership agreements with those other emerging markets to me, it says there's huge potential for development potential, and a lot of South African companies are looking at that. Look for those companies. If they've got good cost management and they seem to have the, you know, a well-balanced uh, strategy, maybe that's where we're going to see a new surge of, of activity. Um, the, you know, against that, we're certainly seeing a tough business environment continuing into next year. Growth potential can be restrained. I can only sum up as an attitude to investment, maintain a low risk profile because it's not a time. We're not in, in a wildly, uh, uh, wildly exciting market arena now. This is where we got our information sources. Um, that's it. Uh, my 10 second commercial, if you need, I'll answer your questions here. If you need to contact me, I'm at the uh, what they call the Center for Risk Analysis, which is part of the SA Institute for Race Relations. We are a serious think tank, not just a political, uh, socio-political organization, looking at scenarios for business and consumer development. And we're, we've got some numbers we're available there. And thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thank you very much. Sure, I used up all the time, plus, yeah. three, plus three minutes. Yeah, we, we, we like to stick 